so uh, I had sent a survey out and several people uh, thankfully filled it out, gave some feedback, and the one that, um, that definitely was the winner was Paul's letters to the churches. Um, so I think that's going to be a, a great study. There are 13 letters that Paul wrote. And uh, they're very practical for us today. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll begin with saying this. So Paul's letters to the churches are addressing different things that are going on within the church. Uh, sometimes it's problems, sometimes it's major problems, uh, and sometimes it's just encouragement that the church is needed. Uh, so there's definitely a lot going on when you have brand new churches that are being planted all over the place. Uh, you're, you had the blending of uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Uh, you have wildly um, varying levels of paganism uh, from city to city. And there's just a lot uh, being factored into that pot of churches. And uh, certainly a lot of issues are, are going to crop up. And so Paul, I think, does an exceptional job of, of addressing those issues within the churches. And I think we can kind of glean these three things, um, both from what Paul writes in his letters to the churches and how we apply them today. So uh, the first question I think that, that we can ask is, what's going on in the church? Uh, and obviously that varied from region to region. It varied from church to church. Uh, and, you know, the issues in Rome were not the same issues in Corinth. Um, and the issues in uh, Philippi were not the same issues that were going on in um, Colossae. So, you know, those issues varied from place to place, much like they do today. But what's going on in the church? Uh, the second question is, how do we respond to that? Um, and the third question is, what is God doing in the life of the Christians? Um, and so as, as we work through these letters, I want you to kind of think about those questions. Uh, I'm going to try to go through in the best chronological order uh, as possible. There's, there's certainly variation on um, agreement for when these letters were written. Uh, and I'm not going to go into a whole spiel about that. Um, we'll, just, we'll do the best that we can to keep them chronological in the order that Paul wrote them. So we're going to begin with Galatians. Uh, Galatians was written to the churches in Galatia. And so the big question is, which Galatia? Um, there's a northern theory, which is the traditional theory that, that held out for many years. Dave, if you want to pull that map up of uh, Galatia. So if you look up a Bible map of Galatia, um, you're probably not going to get this map. Uh, Galatia... Uh, about the 3rd century B.C., were, were uh, Celtics who moved into this region right up in here. So kind of this small area here. And then in 25 B.C., Rome came in and they expanded Galatia to all this green area here, which included uh, all these areas that Paul went on his first missionary journey, which included um, Antioch of Pisidia, um, so you have Antioch right there. That's not the same Antioch that Paul was sent from. That was Antioch over here in Syria. Uh, so Paul first went down to the island where he was from, to Cyprus. So then they came up here to Antioch of Pisidia. And when they got there, um, John Mark actually abandoned him and Barnabas. Um, and that caused a lot of friction. Um, and, and Paul writes about his, uh, ir or Luke actually records it, but Paul's irritation that him and Barnabas on the second journey had such a sharp disagreement because Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and Paul said, absolutely not. Um, and so Paul and Silas went on the second journey, and then Barnabas ended up taking John Mark and a few others, and they went their separate ways. Um, never never to fully reunite again, uh, which is pretty interesting, and we'll talk about that too, um, which falls under the topic of wiping the dust from your feet. When do you wipe the dust from your feet and move on? 
Um, and is it okay to wipe your dust, the, the dust from your feet? Um, so the southern or the the southern Galatia theory is that it includes all of Galatia, all of the churches in, in the Roman region of Galatia, which I am a proponent of because we know of exactly zero churches that exist that Paul planted in northern Galatia. We know of a whole bunch of churches that Paul not only planted, but Paul had intimate knowledge of uh, from both the first and second missionary journeys in southern Galatia. So I'm not going to get into all the reasons and you know, weighing the north versus the south, but to me it makes much more sense uh, that Paul was writing to the churches that he was familiar with. And there's um, some pretty clear evidence, I think, within the, the book of the letter to the Galatian churches anyway, um, that point to a Southern theory. So on the first missionary journey, um, let me get my water because I'm going to need this drink from the trough. Um, what were some of the issues that Paul faced in this region that we just showed you. What did Paul face on his first missionary? Besides for John Mark abandoning them, which is a pretty big deal. It's the very first actual commissioned missionary journey and, and almost immediately they get abandoned by somebody who was supposed to stand by their side. So what were some of the other issues that they faced? Yeah, major issues with the Jews. What specifically were the Jews doing? Yeah, they chased Paul out of every single place that he went. But not only that, um, they, were, uh, they were pitting the Gentiles against Paul, the, the new Gentile converts. Uh, they were agitating them. They were uh, creating all kinds of falsehoods. They were uh, dragging people back to the old law. Uh, and Paul was very explicit that uh, this is not freedom. You know, freedom in Christ is not binding people to the old law, uh, especially the Gentiles. Uh, I'm going to read a, a, a little bit, or maybe I don't even know if I'll read it. Maybe I'll just kind of highlight from Acts chapter 13 some of the things that happened in that region. Um, yes, yeah, verse 13, Acts 13, 13. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from uh, Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went out from uh, Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. So they didn't even make it all the way up to Antioch from the ocean. They docked, they got off, and right away John Mark is like, sayonara, see you later. Now let me ask you guys for a second. I mean, be real about this. Um, try to think hypothetically the best that you can. What would you do if <clears throat> you're in Paul's position, you're in Paul's shoes? Paul is a, by his words, Jew of Jews, advancing well beyond all the other Jews. Uh, he's not bragging there. He's just making a, a, a statement. He's trained under the famous Gamaliel. Um, and Paul is working his tail off to advance and, and know the scriptures, uh, live by the scriptures. Paul's doing his, I mean, he's doing the hard work. This isn't like, you know, the faith just dropped in his lap. Paul's doing the hard work as a Jew. Um, he sees this vision. He's blinded on the road to Damascus. He hears a voice from, from heaven. You know, Jesus calls down, uh, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, you guys know the story. He becomes a Christian. He's baptized. Uh, immediately these scales fall from his eyes. He's able to see again after being blinded for three days. Uh, and then Paul completely changes the course of his life and begins preaching Christ, not only preaching Christ, whom he was persecuting Christians for, but he's preaching to the Gentiles, which a Jew of Jews, you would know, is not an easy task. Um, 
It's not like this natural transition where you're like, okay, now I'm going to preach to the, to the Gentiles. Uh, this was not a natural transition for Paul. This was full of all kinds of challenges. All right, so you're, you're doing all this hard work. The tables have completely turned where you were once the persecutor, you're now being persecuted. And so what, what would some of the expectations be for people who work beside you? Your expectations. We're talking about Barnabas. We're talking about John Mark. What would you expect from them? You know, I'm going to take this. Oh, I know. I know you. <laughs> I've got your number. <clears throat> in Paul's position with everything, keeping in mind, you know, it wasn't just an overnight thing. He takes time before he's out preaching. He's got a lot to learn. Yes. Okay? Yeah. So... Paul being the gun-ho kind of fellow that he's always been, I think his expectations are no higher than what they were with people that traveled with him as the Hebrew of Hebrews. And that indication is his expectations for them weren't very high. Yeah, so in other words, he is... Um Pretty hard-leaning, maybe even borderline zealot. Uh, and, and, and Paul, yeah, uh, so if, if you didn't hear Charles online, uh, Paul's expectations, both when he was a Jew and when he became a Christian, were pretty near zero. He was going to do what he was going to do. Point well taken, uh, based on, I mean, our theme this year, right? Uh, Paul's not waiting around for other people. And, and, and like this is, brings up a really good point. I tend to wait around for other people. I'm a, I'm a peacemaker at my core. And so I tend to wait things out. And I'm like, well, we'll really wait on people to come around. Like I'm the kind of personality that I will wait for people to come around. And I'll be like, eventually they're going to see the light of day and they're going to see the importance of you know just digging in and they're going to see the importance of not getting caught up on all these issues and they're going to see that all that matters is what Paul said Christ and him crucified they're going to come around and so I tend to wait Paul didn't wait um, hardly ever which is funny when he writes about patience because he doesn't strike me as a, a very patient man um, and he probably was um, but Paul was driven more by mission than anything else. Like, Paul knew what was marked out for him. He knew his time on earth was limited. That really resonated with him. He understood the gravity of that. I think a lot of times we don't, especially given our Western culture, uh, where, you know, medicine is magic. And we don't, we don't catch the gravity, most of us, that we literally could blink and be gone tomorrow. Uh, I mean, very literally. And so what, what we do today matters. And Paul caught that. So, yeah, I, I think point well taken um, that Paul was going to do what Paul was going to do. And, it, it, you know, this, regardless of what other people are doing on his mission team. And, and also, I, I think to add to that, P Paul, it doesn't seem like from what Luke wrote that Paul stopped and was like trying to reason with Mark and was like begging him to stay. It's almost like Luke doesn't even mention what went on here. He mentions later that there was this big disagreement. Paul like absolutely refused to bring John Mark. He's like, absolutely not. Like I would die on this hill. No, he's not coming. He abandoned us the first time. He's not fit to come on the second trip. Um, but Paul didn't try to stop and reason with Mark. And, and, and so for Paul, time mattered. Time was important. Mission mattered. Mission was important. And preaching Christ to people 
was of the utmost importance. That was at, at, at the top of the list. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, like I said, I'm the kind of person I would, I would wait around. I would, you know, I would try to reason with somebody. I'd be like, come on, like, what do you mean you're going home? Uh, but Paul doesn't appear to do that. He's like, you want to go home? Fine. Um, John Mark goes back to Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas, they continue that tour throughout Galatia. All right, so um, moving into Galatia, Galatians chapter 1, because I do want to cover the text. Uh, let me hit a couple things right before we get into the text. Um, this is part of why I support a uh, Southern Galatia theory that Paul was writing to churches who knew him. Uh, this is chapter 4, starting in verse 13. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. He's talking to all the churches in Galatia. It was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, of Christ Jesus. What ailment do you think was so bad that it became a burden to the churches in Galatia? What do we know happened to Paul? pretty much immediately when they come into Galatia. We just talked about it a couple weeks ago. Maybe that was on a Wednesday that we talked about it. It's where he was stoned. He was stoned and left for dead. Uh, outside of Timothy's little village, um, of, of, uh, he was there at Lystra and Iconium. Uh, this is a tiny little village where Timothy's from. I mean, tiny. And if you remember, they wanted to sacrifice to Paul. They're like, you know, Zeus and Hermes, we bow down to you. And Paul was like, no, 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 no. And then they, and then they turned on him. Uh, the Jews came down. They, they uh, fired up the, the crowd and they stoned him. What do you know about Jewish stoning? Not to be too gruesome, but um, what do you know about stoning? I always pictured like throwing rocks, pelting people with rocks. And then I learned that that's not right. Yeah, they drop them. Um, people take turns, and it's a very drawn out, slow, agonizing thing where the point is, unlike flogging, which is to bring person, a person as close to death as possible without actually killing them, the purpose of stoning is death. So people come, like David said, they, they come one by one, and they drop rocks and the point is to drop rocks where it counts um, and so yeah where where are you going to kill somebody well in the head uh, in the chest so that's the stoning that Paul received and listen to what Paul says later on and in, in, I mean just the, like the very next verses right I've been, I was a burden to you guys. Uh, my ailment was a burden to you in Galatia. Then he says, um, What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. That's interesting to me that he's writing that only to the Galatian churches. If possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. You would have taken your eyes out and given them to me. Um, a lot of scholars theorize, I, I think probably rightly, that Paul's vision got very bad after he was stoned on that first missionary journey. And Paul writes about his bad eyesight. Um, you know, he wrote in one of his letters, this is me writing, see what large letters I use. In Galatia, yeah. So it's... You know, it's interesting, all these references to his poor eyesight and you would have gouged your eyes out and given them to me. I, I think clearly he's writing to churches who knew uh, very closely what happened to Paul uh, when he was in Galatia. Uh, like Roman Galatia. So anyway, um, back to chapter 1. Uh, I want to get to the content of the letter because uh, I think it's very important. Paul begins his letters, all of them, with a greeting, a body, and 
the, uh, the farewell. Okay, so they're all like very Pauline. Uh, they're very similar. So Paul begins with like a blessing on the church, a, a greeting and a blessing. So starting in verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle... Now, that term can be used two different ways. An apostle generally is someone who is sent. Uh, a missionary is, is, a, is a, uh, kind of a modern term for apostle. Uh, or it can mean one who was sent directly by Jesus. So, uh, for example, one of the 12 apostles. Uh, Paul definitely is using it in the sense uh, as someone sent directly by Jesus, and then he expounds upon that. So, he says, Paul... An apostle, not generically, not a missionary, but he's one sent directly by Jesus. Not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. He appeals to the power of God, having authority over life and death itself. He's the one who sent me. Not man. I wasn't sent by man or from man. Uh, this was all God who raises people from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you let him be accursed it's pretty strong language isn't it even if we came in even if angels came from heaven and preached a different gospel than what we preached when we when we visited you let that person be accursed they went down a very bad path and they distorted the gospel and it's not the true gospel. Do we hear, I mean, honestly, do we hear this kind of strong language within the church today, typically? That's right. Uh, and so we find all kinds of other things other than the gospel itself to be offended about. I mean, a lot of times we do, right? We'll find issues that, like these little molehills that we turn into these big, you know, massive mountains, and we're like, you know, and I'll give you an example. Um, I got a phone call uh, this past week, and I don't know why, but like, are you guys, uh, Charles, I know you are, but like, are you guys familiar with non-institutional churches of Christ? So they're, they're the ones that, uh, they're, this was like a big thing back in the 50s and 60s. Um, you don't, give money to any institutions so no religious organizations like we're meant as christians to to dig in our pockets and just give directly to people in need uh, so you don't give to institutions and part of that non-institutional um, church is like believe it or not a kitchen if you have a kitchen in the church building that's like the cardinal sin where uh, you will be damned for eternity um, and so this gentleman called me and was like hey i have um, you know, this, this evangelism method uh, to help Churches of Christ specifically. And, you know, I don't charge money for it. And, uh, you know, I just want to bless people. So he's kind of given his, you know, little spiel and I'm listening and I'm like, okay, like I'm always open to ideas. And then he goes, wait a minute, I forgot to ask. He's like, you're not institutional, right? He's like, you don't have a kitchen in your church building. I was like, no, we do. Boom, hangs up. Like, literally didn't even say goodbye. It was like, boom. Um, 
And it's just interesting that like churches will pick all these issues and Paul, listen to what Paul zeroes in on. Like not just for this letter, but for all of his letters. Like even though there are all these issues he's addressing, the main issue is the gospel of Christ. You get that wrong, you mess that up, you mess with that, you twist the gospel of Christ, you're eternally damned. Like it's that important. All right, so Paul, like, he's astonished at this. Like, I can't believe that these people who would give your eyes out for me, that you listened, you witnessed what Paul went through, uh, they, they knew about it, they saw the condition he was in, and they're abandoning the gospel, or twisting it, buying into this false gospel. Uh, verse 9, as we've said before, and, and so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For now, uh, uh, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. <laughs> if anybody has been in any kind of ministry, and I'm not talking about like paid preachers, I'm just talking about like ministry in general. You get that statement, right? If I'm trying to please man, ministry, if you're really in ministry for the right reasons, I'm not talking about like all the false teachers and, you know, the, the health and wealth, you know, like robbing people blind, the, all these evan televangelists who are living in like 14, 16, 18 million dollar homes, compounds, like it's crazy. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about if you go into ministry because God has placed that on your heart, Correct me if this is not a fair statement. You're in for a life of hardship. Um, it's, it's tough. Um, Paul's like, if, if you think I'm here to please people, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be a gospel preacher. Life is tough, not because... Christians are bad and, you know, they're mean and all that. That's not the issue. The issue is you're dealing with a lot of complexities and you're dealing with salvation itself. And it's just, it's tough. It's really tough. So I think he makes a great point here. Um, like, I'm not writing this letter to, to, like, you know, puff you guys up and make you feel good about yourselves. Um, I'm out here preaching the gospel, and you guys are perverting it. You're twisting it. And I can't believe. Paul's in shock. Like, he's actually in shock that these same churches that he once knew are now twisting the gospel and perverting it. Uh, verse 11, For I, I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Uh, this is another... Uh, I have all kinds of... Soap boxes, um, I guess. Not really soap boxes, just side point. Uh, I was talking to a good friend of mine, really good friend of mine, uh, who's also a, a, a preacher and, uh, here in Pennsylvania. He's like, you know, it's interesting. Like, did you ever notice that we get blacklisted from speaking at places because we don't have the right, you know, church? Uh, what he meant by that is we're not like, in the popular cluster of churches of Christ. He's like, we can get up and speak truth to the gospel, and we can speak well, we can articulate ourselves well, but that's not what people are looking for. They're looking for like the popular, well-known you know, speakers to come in and kind of massage the ears of people. Uh, Paul's crystal clear. That that's not 
That's not his mission. That's not his jam. That's not his vibe. That's not what he's here for. So again, he says, I, I, I'd have you know, the gospel that was preached by me, is not, it's not man's gospel. I'm not here preaching from my heart and from my gut and talking about my feelings of you know, Christianity. He's just preaching raw, straight-up gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among people so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. There it is. He was a zealot by his own admission. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, did I not immediately cons- uh, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, talking about the twelve. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit with Cephas, that is Peter, and I remained with him 15 days, pretty small amount of time. For three years after Paul became a Christian, he had this many interactions with the other apostles. This many. Christians. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, and, you know, um, I've saw a, a couple commentators kind of make it, I think, a valid point. That, like, to think that Paul went away and didn't preach at all uh, is not really Paul's style either. Like, Paul probably, most likely, was preaching pretty much immediately when he became a Christian, which makes his authority, I think, even greater. Um, you know, Paul was preaching what was revealed to him, not by man, but by God. Like, Paul didn't consult with people. That's incredible. And look at the consistency of his gospel and compare that to the other apostles and what they preach. Look at Peter's sermon at the day of Pentecost and compare that with some of the things that Paul writes. I'm tremendously consistent. Tremendously consistent. So Paul wants to make that point you know, very strongly. I didn't start preaching. You know, we're going to compare notes and talk about what we're... This was direct revelation from God. Um, Verse 18, and then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remain with him 15 days, but I saw no one of of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, And I was uh, still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. By the way, uh, those Christians, the bulk of them who were in Jerusalem, who never really met Paul unless they were in cuffs being led away, They knew of Paul's reputation, and they fled Jerusalem. That's how the church got started in Antioch of Syria, the sending church of Paul. I love that story because Luke records, like we get hung up on the name. They were called Christians first in Antioch. And we're like, oh, you know, like we're making this argument that that's why we're called Christians and, you know, such a good, strong name. And like that's not the point of what Luke's, writing at all, Luke makes this point where there's this paradox that the sending church, the people who blessed Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, John Mark, (laughs) he did get better. Um, The church that blessed them and sent them was a church literally the size of this congregation who met in a cave that they carved out 
and they were inside the mountainside, hiding from Paul. Isn't that incredible? Like, if anything ought to blow us away, and we'd be like, man, look, look at God in working in the lives of people and just taking his spirit and leading and blessing and moving beyond all these circumstances. That's incredible. The sending church is the church, most of whom were from Jerusalem. They weren't even from Syria. They're from Jerusalem, and they're hiding from Paul. And we know, you know, we know from the scriptures they were paranoid when they heard Paul became a Christian. They, they were extremely wary of that. They were like, nah, it doesn't sound right. And it was Barnabas, uh, Bar is son in Hebrew. Uh, Barnabas means son of encouragement. He goes around and he vouches for Paul. And it was because of Barnabas that Paul was able to, to be received and believed as a credible preacher of the gospel, uh, which is honestly a pretty big leap. And you have family members who are killed because of this man, and now you have to not only believe that he's a Christian, but that he's an apostle commissioned by Jesus himself. Pretty big leap. And so I commend not only Paul and his companions, but I commend the church in Antioch. And I'm like, what? What a tremendous amount of faith and grace and uh, trust that it would take for them to spin their minds around and be like, all right, we're going to go for it. We're going to bless you and send you, and let's see what God does. Um, that's a big leap. So anyway, we're going to stop there for today. Um, we're definitely out of time, but... Uh, I'm going to try to go through these letters pretty quickly because there are 13 of them. And um, it will be very easy to get hung up. But we covered a chapter today, Brent. Not bad, huh? <laughs> um, yeah. So, all right. Thank you, guys. And if you have questions, um, stuff to bring for next week, uh, be thinking about those. And uh, we'll certainly start uh, with your questions that you have. All right, thank you.